Well, okay then. Well, let's get into this thing. Um, we have uh, spent a lot of time uh, in this last year asking ourselves questions about our spiritual growth, right? We spent a lot, most of the year last year talking about that, asking ourselves these questions. Where am I in my spiritual growth? What's my next step? And we asked ourselves nine questions, right? So here they are. Does my sin bother me? Do I have a growing love for others? Are the fruit of the Spirit evident and growing in my life? Number four was, am I connected to other believers? Am I becoming a person of prayer was number five. Do I have a hunger for God's Word? Number six. Number seven was, is my worship fresh and vibrant? Number eight was, how am I responding to trouble? And then number nine was, am I consistently overcoming uh, temptation? Well, these are all fantastic questions to ask. Uh, if you want to know where you are in your relationship with God and how you are growing or not growing uh, spiritually. In fact, if you consistently ask yourself those nine questions uh, as you're going through this new year, you're going to see all kinds of uh, uh, progress happening in your life. You're going to begin to uh, have great things happening if you could just do nothing but that. You just start asking yourself those questions as you go through the year, those nine. Now, here's the deal. There are a lot more questions. We may get into some of them uh, in the weeks ahead. They may be repackaged and redone, and we'll just go through some of those things because these are not the only nine principles or realities of spiritual growth, right? They're a fantastic starting point, though. So anyway, that's what those questions are all about. So you'll... Uh, if if you ask yourself those questions, then adjust your life accordingly. You're going to see all kinds of growth in your in your life this year. But we are in the first Sunday of a new year. You guys glad to be in a new year? I, tell, I said this last week. Not everything changes just magically because the cow because we're in an, another day. It changes magically because it's a new day, right? <laughs> Every day is a fresh opportunity. But it is a new year. First Sunday of the new year, and there are a lot of people who are thinking about asking themselves uh, different kinds of questions about changes they want to see in their life this year. Um, they're asking, what kinds of goals do I need to set for myself, right? You hear people talking about that, the dreaded New Year's resolution, right? I resolve to, and they usually don't last very long, right? <laughs> but people are thinking about that, and that's actually a good time to do this. When a new year comes around, uh, when there's a marker on the calendar of some kind that's uh, saying goodbye to one part and hello to another part, that's a good time to start thinking again about, okay, it's time for me to uh, start fresh and go through the year. So it's all a good thing. But this morning, I would like to suggest that we look a little bit farther ahead than even just this year and start asking ourselves a different kind of question today. And this is not part of the nine, this is not part of the questions to ask ourselves. I, I just suggest that we're going to look at something a little bit farther along. So we're going to begin uh, by first looking at this passage of scripture from the Old Testament. Okay, so I'm going to read this and I'll tell you what I'm talking about. First Kings, Old Testament. We jumped into the Old Testament. It's fun. 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. As the time approached for David to die, he ordered his son Solomon, As for me, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong and be a man, and keep your obligation to the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes, commands, ordinances, and decrees. This is written in the law of Moses so that you will have success in everything you do and wherever you turn. And so that the Lord will fulfill his promise that he made to me. If your sons take care to walk faithfully before me with all their heart and all their soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne in Israel. The question I'd like for us to consider this morning, again, unrelated to the previous series we've been going through, but the question I'd like for us to consider this morning is simply this. What will my personal legacy be? What will my personal legacy be? Or rather, what will be my personal legacy? Let's pray again together. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word and this story that you have preserved for us for all these thousands of years uh, that we could gain insights today and apply right now in our family, in our job, in our day-to-day -day life, 
and the mundane things that we go through every day for the crises that happen and the, the challenges and all of those things. Lord, you perverged, uh, preserved your word for us for such a day as this. I pray that you speak to us now through it in Jesus' name. We pray together. Amen. All right, so the word legacy has basically some legal origins, its roots, uh, the roots of that whole idea of a legacy is about uh, something handed down or received from an ancestor or a predecessor. We talk about leaving a legacy, and sometimes legally you're talking about your, uh, your earthly goods and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the, the root of that sort of idea, leaving a legacy, a legacy. But it's what kinds of memories, character, teaching, and life are we leaving for and investing in junior, future generations? I'm, I'm stumbling over my words a little bit here. Ah, maybe it's time for more. <laughs> this is the uh, emergency, the emergency stash. Quick, quick, uh, quick coffee. <laughs> quick, he's starting to stumble. He's starting to stumble. You didn't have the code, just <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank sure. you. Is that all? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Liana. You're welcome. <laughs> Rounds of applause online, please. Thank you for Liana. There they are. Please help Johnny get on track and stop stumbling around. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that, my love. All right, so what kind of memories, <laughs> let me say that all again, what kind of memories, character, teaching, and life are we leaving for and investing in future generations? I see why I got stumbled. That's an awkward sentence, I was saying. What will we leave behind? What will we be known for in the years ahead? What will be your personal legacy? Now, it's important to understand that our personal legacy is about who we are becoming, it's not just about what am I going to do, what kinds of things am I going to accomplish, what kinds of, uh, how much money am I going to leave for my kids and grandkids or whatever. <laughs> my kids are going to be so disappointed when I die, by the way, <laughs> in that regard. But no, hopefully just in that regard. <laughs> no, I need to get that straight, too. Um, but <laughs> it's about who you're becoming more than what you accomplish because what we do in our life literally flows from who we're becoming. So if you were going to set some goals this year about your home personal legacy for, let's say we all got another 60 years in us. <laughs> let's say 60 years from now, you're, you're going to plan for. What are the things you can do today to become the kind of person God would want you to be? Because the kind of person God wants you to be will cause you to do the kinds of things and set the right kinds of goals. There's nothing worse than climbing up a big, long ladder forever, you know, going way up and spending a lot of time climbing that ladder and just realizing that ladder when you finally get to the top was on the wrong building, right? It's on the wrong wall. So you want to be on the right one. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 3 tells us, guard your heart above all else for it is the source of life. Uh, the New International Version translates that verse this way, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And so there's this idea of putting a guard around your heart uh, to protect your heart because it's who you become and everything flows uh, from that. Uh, then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. There's a beautiful verse about placing our faith in Jesus. He creates us as new people. He gives us a fresh new personhood. Right? We're fresh, we're new. It, doesn't, it isn't just about, hey, if you'll place your faith in me, do this and do this and do this and do this, and here's a long list of stuff I want you to do. It's the idea of you become a new person who will begin to do new things. Right. All right, so anyway, it's who are we becoming? So when we ask ourselves, what will be my personal legacy, uh, it's about what kind of person am I going to become? So how do we do this? How do we build a godly personal legacy today. Well, you're going to have one. I will tell you that. It's either going to be a great one or it's going to be a bad one. You're going to have a great godly legacy or you're going to have a bad legacy. But how do we keep it on track? How do we keep um, our lives pointing in the right direction and having a godly legacy? So here's the first thing that we need to do today. And that's simply this. Number one, keep an eye and really both eyes toward the finish line. Keep an eye toward the finish line. Look again at 1 Kings 2, verses 1 and 2. And again, this is King David. He's near the end of his life, and he's pulling his son Solomon 
uh, who has his own story too, just like your parents have their story and you have your story and you have to live your story. But he pulls him to him and he gives him some final advice and some things. So in verse one, again, it says that the time approached for David to die. The time approached for David to die. Not all of us are going to have this luxury, by the way, where we are going to be, oh, I'm near death. I'm about to die. Uh, so let me gather everyone around me. Some people do. And it's such a wonderful blessing. We, you, know, you have some relatives, right? Yes. Uh, the grandmother, uh, where you get to do that. But most of us may not have that opportunity, right? But he has this great opportunity. Bring his son to him. And it says, the time approached for David to die. He ordered his son Solomon. As for me, I am going the way of all the earth. He's like, I am going to die, right? No matter how great I am, no matter all the great accomplishments I have had, there is a time and I am now going to die. He understood that his days were numbered. Some of us live our life as if our days are not numbered. And we got all the time. It's just open-ended from now to eternity here on planet Earth. But the truth is, the best legacies come from those who understand that our time on Earth is limited. Now, those of you who are really young, you're like in your teens and your 20s, and you're like, oh, man, we've got all kinds of time. But you don't know that. You don't. None of us do. We don't know how much time we have. But if we live knowing that that day is coming, it changes what we do in the days we have. So anyway, David understood that his days were numbered. And we need to understand this also. Our days are numbered. He wrote in, uh, David himself wrote in a previous time, Psalms 39, verses 4 through 7. <clears throat> Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days so that I will know how short-lived I am. In fact, you have made my days just inches long and my lifespan is as nothing to you. Yes, every human being stands as only a vapor. Yes, a person goes about like a mere shadow. Indeed, they rush around in vain, gathering possessions without knowing who will get them. Speaking of inheritance, right? Now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. My hope is in you. And then Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 to 28 says, And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this judgment, so also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Wow. Our days are numbered. Your time on this planet is numbered. And some people think that that's so depressing, right? You're like, I'm so, I'm so, you know, why are you talking about death? It's like the What About Bob movie, right? The little kid, that's an old movie, old reference, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> you are going to die. He's just depressed, and walking around like death, always wearing black. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. It's not about being depressed. It's about having a realistic understanding of your life and knowing that, that we are only given a certain amount of time. It makes you, I mean, if you ask yourself today, you say, what if I knew I was going to die tonight? What would you do differently today? Well, can I just suggest that some of what you might do in that panic moment, you could do today anyway, right? <laughs> Don't wait till the end. Do it now. Anyhow, I don't mean to be morbid as we're talking about this, but I want, you to, I want to encourage you to take a moment, the first Sunday of this brand new year, and I want you to think beyond this year, because again, I just gave us all 60 years or so, right, <laughs> in, our, in our imagination. Fast forward way ahead. So you're not going to die for a long time. I'm just going to encourage you, but you might. Anyhow. <laughs> But I want you to imagine and think about your funeral for a minute. Not the funeral of someone you know who's recently passed away. I don't want to bring up some pain this morning, but I want you to think about you. Think about you, just you, your funeral. Who will be there? Who's going to be there at your funeral? What will they say about you? What kinds of stories will they tell about you? What will they think about you? Who will be impacted by your departure the most? Who will even care at your funeral? What will it say on your gravestone or marker or, or vase or whatever? Or urn. Yeah, that's it. I said vase. <laughs> this is not a flower. That's what mine is. <laughs> no. What will be on there? Uh, 
I mean, what kinds of things? I mean, seriously, uh, he could really hold his beer. I mean, what, 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 do you, what do you want? Sometimes we're so flippant about things. I mean, he was a, he was a pretty good guy. Uh, she went to work a lot and finally got some sleep. I mean, what is, what, <laughs> what is going to be on your tombstone? I remember uh, Mel Blank, the voice of uh, Bugs Bunny and, and all of those Warner Brothers cartoons characters on his tombstone. It says, duh, 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but that's all, folks. When I was a teenager, I used to think it'd be really funny if at my funeral, you might want to remember this, Leona. Okay. Because Leona's going to live much longer than I ever will. Uh, <laughs> that look on your face is just startling. <laughs> I always thought it'd be funny if at my funeral, I prearranged to have my voice recorded and a little speaker <laughs> in the casket, right? And then when people walked by for my final viewing, it would play recordings of me saying things, talking like Groucho Marx, you know, <laughs> like... Uh, you think I look bad? At least I'm dead. What's your excuse? You know, that sort of thing, you're right. <laughs> oh, probably shouldn't do that, right? <laughs> I'm just asleep. <laughs> and you still owe me that $20, right? Or, or whatever. <laughs> anyway, I thought that would be hilarious. Anyway, I'm just trying to lighten it up a little, right? Because we're talking about the funeral. I know it got kind of dark there for a minute, so I just want to kind of bring us back up and lighten things up a little. Oh, well, here's the deal. The Bible reminds us that life is a vapor, it says. It goes by quickly. James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 say, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like a vapor that appears for a little while, and then vanishes. Man, I can attest to this, how fast the years go by. Every time I have another birthday, I'm thankful for it. <laughs> it's better than the alternative. <clears throat> but I'm always amazed at how fast the time really flies by. So what will your personal legacy be? What will it look like when you reach the finish line? It will help to give you a filter for how you live your life today. So here's the second thing I would suggest for us to consider this morning. Not only should we keep an eye towards the finish line, but secondly, we should, uh, or I should say it this way, run your legacy race today. Run your legacy race today. Today is very important, even though we're looking forward, looking ahead to the possible, you know, when we possible, we possibly die. <laughs> no, we're all going to die. <laughs> i got bad news for everyone <laughs> and good news. Today is very important. Matthew 6, verses 33 through 34 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, right? We quoted this recently uh, in terms of God providing for us, and we don't need to be anxious and worrying. And it's about resolving that ultimate issue of life. First of all, knowing are you going, what's going to happen to you after you die? Beyond your legacy here, what happens next? Where will you be? And all of us will spend eternity somewhere. Somewhere. Where will you be? You can take a lot of anxiety out of that by placing your faith and trusting in Jesus today to save you and reserving your spot in heaven and the new heaven and new earth that's coming one day. But today is important. Hebrews 3 verses 13 through 15 says, But encourage each other daily while it's still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. As it is said today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. It's an, it is an appeal and, and a sense of urgency to not miss God speaking to you today. You need to run your legacy race today, not one of these days, not I'm going to get it all together one of these days, and then I'm going to come to church, and I'm going to do this or that. Today is the day. Uh, today is the day of salvation, it says in another place in Scripture. Psalms 18, 118, 24, we quote all the time, this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. So here are some ways you can run your uh, legacy race today. Just a few things I want to throw out here before we uh, leave today. First is simply this, obey the Lord. How do I run my legacy race today? Again, like to keep it clear in the messages and our teaching 
So you don't go home and go, I didn't really understand. It was really deep what he was talking about today. He used some big theological words and it was, whew, that was powerful. <laughs> Boy, it was deep. I had no idea what he said. I don't understand a word of it. <laughs> So let's keep it simple, right? Let's keep it simple, but still powerful. And that is simply this, obey the Lord. Uh, back to 1 Kings 2 again, uh, looking at this. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 says, As for me, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong and be a man. And then verse 3 says, And keep your obligation to the Lord your God to walk in his ways and keep his statutes, commands, ordinances, and decrees. This is written in the law of Moses so that you will have success in everything you do and wherever you turn. And so Old Testament here, and, and David is saying, look, son, my son, if you're going to be successful in this life, if you're going to have an impact in this life, if you're going to uh, do and be all that you should be, you need to obey the Lord your God. You need to obey the commands and the decrees that he set out for your strength, safety, and goodwill. Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2 says, How happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. You know, that's not something we also often associate, right? If I say obey the Lord, you don't immediately go, oh, that sounds happy. I'll be happy. Somehow we've gotten this weird, twisted idea, backwards idea, that to obey the Lord is somehow miserable. It's like, I want to do this. This is where all the joy and the fun and all the happiness in life is. But okay, God, I will obey you. And that's so backwards. Even scripture's telling us here in Psalm 119, 1 and 2, how happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. Verse Samuel 15, verse 22 is simply, then Samuel said, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. And uh, here was the uh, prophet Samuel who was uh, telling uh, Saul that, hey, look, the thing is, you may offer great things trying to buy, buy off God or get your own glory or give a lot and sacrifice many things. He said, but you're disobeying the Lord. And the more important thing is to obey the Lord. What has God told you to do that you have not yet done? Think back over 2020. Yeah, it was a challenging year, but every year has its challenges. We've just got a little magnifying glass on, on some of these <laughs> from this past year. It was a challenging year. But there were a lot of blessings as well. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you this, God did not check out, oh, 2020, I'll see you back in 2021, and God left. You know, it didn't happen that way. He was still active and at work all year long. All year long, he's been beckoning to you with every crisis, with every problem, with every challenge that you have faced. God has leaned close to you and whispered to you, listen to me, follow me. And so he's given us all of these great opportunities. What has he told you to do? that you have not yet done? What instruction from the Lord has he given you that you do need right now to obey today? What has he told you to stop doing? What is he telling you to start doing? <laughs> Maybe uh, there's some of you, perhaps, you've placed your faith in Jesus somewhere this year, somewhere you prayed with me in one of our services online, or on one of our uh, in-person gatherings, and you did that, but you didn't tell anybody. You, you didn't follow through with that. You didn't send the email, right? I always say at the end, hey, if you prayed with me, let me know, send me an email. And truthfully, you have placed your faith in Jesus. You're just a little bit nervous about what to do next and what you need next. your next step needs to be. There I am again, hang on a second. <laughs> Wait, maybe this is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, Tracy. Coffee's never the problem. Your next step may be that you need to be baptized. You need to follow through and show the world, your friends and family, that you have placed your faith in Jesus. And in a symbolic way, you are now demonstrating that you're dying to who you were and that you have new life in Jesus and you can be a part of it. If you'd like to be baptized, you absolutely today need to send me a direct message on Facebook today. You need to send me an email, johnny at compassdenver.com and say, I'd like to be baptized. What do I need to do? And I'd love to talk with you about that. We want to see many people follow through 
uh, with baptism and following their, uh, placing their faith in Jesus, of course, first, and then following through with baptism. A, a pastor named uh, Ron Emonson, man, I think it's Edmondson, actually. I think I have a typo here. He said the, deci- the decisions you, why am I doing that? <laughs> Slow down. It's because I'm always thinking about your time. I'm always thinking, we need to wrap this up. All right. The decisions you are making today are already impacting the legacy you will leave someday. That's a great quote. The decisions you're making today are already impacting the legacy you will leave someday. Okay, so obey the Lord this morning. Don't delay. Do it while it's still called today. Here's another thing you can do to run your legacy race today, and that is drop the weights. Drop the weights. Clang. Right? We were working out. Remember we were working out, Tracy? Those were the days. It's been a long time. (laughs) We dropped the weights a year ago. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, I am not going to go into now an illustration about Leona and I uh, five years ago, six years ago, whenever it was, running a half marathon. Looking forward, if Leona and I were getting ready right now, if we were, (laughs) to run a big race, I'll tell you right now how we're going to do it. All right, she's going to be wearing a big, thick, heavy fur coat. I'm going to be wearing an inflatable sumo wrestler outfit with ankle weight. No. No, of course not. That's not, that's not how you run her. I think I'd pay to see that, too. That's, you guys are giving me an idea now. No, no, no. Yeah, we can raise some money or something. It's the, it's the inflatable sumo race. That might be pretty funny, actually. But if you're a real race, right, a real foot race... You do not want to have as much weight on you as possible. You want to strip off as much as you can. Uh, hey, our friend Bob doesn't even wear shoes, really. He, he wears those barefoot things he, he puts on. Anyway, you want, to, you want to lay aside the things that are going to uh, weigh you down is the idea. So what do you have in your life that is a weight? Something that is keeping you from running the race your legacy race. I'm not calling it a legacy race because everything you do every day is building your legacy. Something that's keeping you from running that race with endurance and keeping your eyes on Jesus. What is it? Is it a substance of some kind? Is there a substance of some kind that you use all the time and it's actually become a weight? It's not necessarily a negative sin uh, in and of itself, but it's something that's in your life and it's keeping you from going full force in your life with following Jesus with all that you are. What is that? Is there a habit? It's just something that you do, just a habit, but that habit is keeping you from being all God wants you to be. Uh, Is there an activity in your life that just wastes so much of your time? If you were to sit and you were to measure it and you looked at it and you realized, wow, most of my life is about this thing because it's what I end up doing all the time. It might be just sitting in front of the TV or online or playing a game or something. Who knows? Um, Michelangelo, I know, with all the tripping of my, of my lips and tongue, I'm not sure I should even try. Michelangelo did a little visio, beyond it, the sign. I'm not going to write. He's got this really long name. The actually, everybody knows him as Michelangelo, the famous uh, <laughs> sculptor, painter, architect of the 15th century. It's Michelangelo, not Michelangelo. I know a lot of people say, yeah, a lot of people think it's Michelangelo. It's not Michelangelo, it's Michelangelo. All right, anyway, <clears throat> he said this. He said when someone was asking him about some of, one of his uh, famous uh, sculptures, one was of an angel. He says, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. <laughs> he saw the angel in the block of marble and he chipped away until there was nothing but the angel he saw remaining. Uh, He's also quoted as being the one who said, the sculpture is already complete within the marble rock before I start my work. It's already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material, the extra stuff. Others have said, I just chip away at it until there's nothing left but what, you know, that, that, that image. 
Some of us need to do that. <clears throat> there are things you need to get a bigger and better picture of your life and what it needs to be and the end game and the end goal and everything in your life that is surrounding you and is keeping you from being that, you need to begin to whittle away. Things that are not necessarily sin, they're not necessarily horrible things, they're just things that are keeping you from being all God wants you to be. They're keeping you from running the race the way he would want. So you need to drop the weights. So obey the Lord, drop the weights. But here's a third way we can run our legacy race today, right? And that is to stay on course. It is just to stay on course. We've been talking about King David, but there was another king in the Old Testament. And his name was King Asa. King Asa, A-S-A. And for most of his reign, he had a total dependence upon God. Here's an example in 2 Chronicles, uh, 2 Chronicles 14, verse 11. It says, Then Asa cried out to the Lord his God, Lord, there is no one besides you to help the mighty and those without strength. Help us, Lord our God, for we depend on you. And in your name we have come against this large army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let a mere mortal hinder you. Right? Words of faith, uh, dependence upon God for the decisions as king he was making uh, that would impact the kingdom. But later on, he took a bad step. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the 36th year of Asa, Israel's king, Baasha, went to war against Judah. He built Ramah in order to keep anyone from leaving or coming to King Asa of Judah. So Asa brought out the silver and gold from the treasuries of the Lord's temple and the royal palace and sent it to Aram's king, Ben-Hadad, who lived in Damascus, saying, There is a treaty between me and you. Between my father and your father, look, I have sent you silver and gold. Do, uh, go break your treaty with Israel's king, Baasha, so that he will withdraw from me. This was a problem because, as we see in verse 7 of chapter 16, it says, At that time the seer Hanani came to King Asa of Judah and said to him, Because you depended on the king of Aram, I'm sorry, Aram, and depended and have not depended on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from you. Basically, you depended on somebody else and you stopped depending on the Lord and you made a big decision based on your own fear and your own way of looking at things and you turned away from the Lord. Now, this decision affects the rest of King Asa's life, really. Uh, and it determines his legacy. 2 Chronicles 16, verses 12 through 13 says, In the 39th year of his reign, Asa developed a disease in his feet, and his disease became increasingly severe. Yet even in his disease, he didn't seek the Lord, but only the physicians. Asa rested with his ancestors. He died in the 41st year of his reign. One big, bad, dumb move really determined the course of the rest of his life. Didn't have to. It did not have to. At any time, Asa could have stopped. He could have come to his senses. He could have turned back to the Lord, but he didn't. And today, you may be one bad step away from ruining your personal legacy. It's something you were just on the cusp of. It's something you're about ready to do. It's a decision you're about to make. It's something that you're stepping into, and you're doing it without any counsel from the Lord at all. You're not seeking him at all, and you're about to make a monstrously bad decision that could change your life forever in a bad way. I want to encourage you today to stay on course. So we need to keep an eye toward the finish line, run our legacy race today. That means obey the Lord, drop the weights, and stay on course. Lastly this morning, and that is to consider the after party. <laughs> There's so many ways I could have said this. <clears throat> but consider the after party. And, uh, and I'm not really talking about the celebration if you're a follower of Jesus. <laughs> that you'll have in heaven one day, right? Because <laughs> that, is, that is something to consider. That is an after party of sorts, right? But consider the after party. After you're gone, what will you leave behind? Wrapping up, looking back at King David here, we see in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 4, and so that the Lord will fulfill his promise that he made to me, if your sons take care to walk faithfully before me with all their heart and all their soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. The decisions and choices being made today can have a major impact on the world after you're gone. Even after you're not even on this planet anymore. Think about it. How many of you guys are living with the impact of a parent who was terrible in your life? Or of a boss from years ago? 
or somebody you had a relationship with years ago or even recently, and that has impacted your world and they're not even around anymore. Just consider how powerful a thing that is. I remember going to my Papaw Withers. Right? That's what we call it, Papaw. Papaw Withers. Papaw Withers was a rough dude. <laughs> I could tell you some horrible stories about him. <laughs> uh, I do know that, that he, I don't, I think he learned to speak English through a cursing filter because he couldn't do any sentence without some kind of curse word. <laughs> I mean, whoa, I mean, just like, hmm. Anyway, he lived a kind of a, a rough uh, existence, rough life. And I remember that we used to go and we would visit him and he lived in this little shack. It didn't even have running water. It was in the north end of Louisiana. So, I mean, it's like it's whatever you, those of you who've never been to like deep south anywhere, imagine that the south is. It really was. <laughs> You're wrong in your thoughts most of the time. But in this one, it's probably right because it's like out in the woods, a little shack, no running water. <laughs> And um, anyway, but we would come and visit him. And, you know, we just celebrated Christmas. And I remember when we would go to see my granddad at Christmas, even though I call him Pop, Papa, we got Papa, Papa, Papa. I think we got Papa, actually. But anyway, um, his gift to us would always be like an apple or an orange. So he's really poor. Well, anyhow, uh, several years later, after he had passed away, uh, Leon and I, I mean, it had been many years since he passed away, we were driving from uh, somewhere in north Louisiana, and we took a different route. I thought, hey, let's go this way, and let's stop by the, the cemetery and see my Paul's grave, and let's see his house. And when we uh, drove up to the, to the place, I saw the cemetery, and then drove on a little bit farther and started looking for his house. And we couldn't find it. Well, I know this is it. And so we, we drove in, and... Um, uh, and and, and I, I went back, doubled back. We came back again. I said, it's got to be right here. I said, has it just overgrown? Got out of the car. I remember walking around and it dawned on me what had happened is that that old shack had been demolished and nothing had been put in its place. And so now the grass had grown and it was as if he had never existed on that place. And it was a, kind of a profound moment for me because, I mean, it kind of shook me. It's just the physical reality of, wow, nothing is forever. All that was left of my granddad was the memories that I had, the stories that we had, the things that he did, the things that he didn't do. And many of those were negative, frankly. But his legacy was nothing physical that he left behind at all. I just, it was just amazing. That's all of us, man. Anything you think you're building with your world one day is going to be covered with grass. What a thought, huh? So I would say to you today, as you consider the after party, invest in things that will last, in things that will last. Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then I would say, invest in other people. Your children, certainly. But also, if you're a follower of Jesus, just begin to invest in the people around you. Philippians 2, verses 3 through 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. King David's desire was to build the temple of the Lord. That's what his heart's desire was. When God told him that he... It wouldn't be him, but it would be his son who would build the temple. David begins while he's alive, storing away the resources to make it happen after he was gone. Um, I, my mom passed away. How many years now? Oh, my. I've lost track. Six, Five, seven? Yeah, the first year we were here. First year we were here. We hadn't been here a few months, and my mom passed away. It really kind of surprised us uh, when she passed away. But here's the thing. For many months after that, and my mom was also poor, by the way. <laughs> in fact, we're talking about an inheritance. We had an inheritance of so many things, but you know, we were like, we're not going to get wealthy from some big will reading or something. <laughs> but I was surprised. She had stashed away little things, and she had gotten this insurance policy, and she'd gotten this other thing that she had going. And it just seemed like every other month or so, my family received a check <laughs> from the estate of my mom. <laughs> And it was crazy. The, the old car I drive around was also an inheritance from my mom. And I'm thinking, man, that's, that's what she did. She invested in such a way 
uh, that it had an impact after she was gone. We actually were able to move to Colorado and really establish and get started starting Compass Church in part because of the generosity of my mom that extended beyond her life here on planet Earth. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's a powerful thing to think. What will your personal legacy be? Keep an eye to the finish line. Run your legacy race today. Consider the after party. Uh, Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 8. As I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who love loved his appearing. I was kidding about my funeral before, sort of. <laughs> you don't need a little speaker in Groucho Marx lines. But there is a song that I'd like at least quoted at my, at my funeral, I think. It's by uh, a recording artist who hasn't been doing much of anything these days. His name is Steve Taylor, and it's called The Finish Line. It's one of my favorite old songs. The last lyrics of the song are, Off in the distance, bloodied but wise, as you squint with the light of the truth in your eyes, I saw you, both hands were raised, I saw your lips move in praise, and I saw you steady your gaze for the finish line. Every idol... Like dust, a word scattered them all, and I rose to my feet as you scaled the last wall, and I gasped when I saw you fall in his arms at the finish line. Let's pray together. God, I pray that we would all decide today to finish well, that we would live this life with an eye to the future, not living in the future, not living in the past, living today, but with an eye to the finish line. I pray for everyone here today who knows you as Lord and Savior that they would have a renewed sense of that starting this new year. And for those who don't know Christ today, God, I pray that this is the day that they come to know you. Lord, uh, I pray that you would touch their hearts right now. So now as I pause this prayer while we're still in an attitude of prayer, I just say to those of you out there, you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you've never started that journey, and your past is nothing but a mess. Or... Your past is just empty without God. Either way, and you know today's the day you need to place your faith in Jesus, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I don't understand everything, but I believe today that you died on a cross and took my sin upon you. And I am thankful, Lord, that you did that for me. I believe you died on the cross, rose from the dead, and that you're coming back again in the best way I can understand. Lord, thank you for loving the world and loving me. I give my life to you. Forgive me of all of my sin. I want to start running this race with you today. I give my life to you. For all the Christ followers uh, who are with us today, pray this with me. Lord, help me to have the right sense and attitude as I go into the rest of this week, the rest of this day, certainly the rest of this year, and the rest of my life. Give me a joy in front of me that is stronger and better than any challenge or struggle I face today. And that is to see you, to know you, and to have run the race well. Lord, give us all a lasting legacy that points directly to you. We pray these things now in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you guys. Say goodbye in the comments. And we are done.